started with a team instead of being a one-woman show in July. And so since then, we have done a little bit of outreach. The Lost Coast Outpost reached out to us. We did a small segment on the local news. And uh, yeah, so just beginning to kind of get the word out there. And so before July, it was just you... Before running the show. July, it was just me. You know, I had uh, moved here in 2018 and was really recruited because of a background in perinatal substance use. Um, so I'm a family physician, but I did a two year fellowship in maternal child and reproductive health that was at the University of New Mexico. And there we actually really focus on people who are pregnant and struggling with substance use disorders. So I'm also boarded in addiction medicine. And the bottom line is you can't hang out with families who are struggling with substance use without basically falling into a place of looking for the root cause and finding developmental trauma. Just finding that most people who are really struggling with addiction, even when they are in their early parenting experiences or even while they're currently pregnant, usually there's trauma at the root of that. So that has just sent me on what's been like a six-year journey of becoming a trauma therapist in a couple different forms of, you know, modalities of psychotherapy and including ketamine as part of that in August 2020. Um, so did training then and then started weaving that into my private practice in April of 2021. Was that a surprising moment when you realized, oh, a lot of this is tied to trauma? You know, I think that w one of the things I love about trauma is that we all know what it is, right? Like we can smell it. We it's become so much a part of the common parlance now. We all talk about trauma and sometimes in a joking way, like, oh, the line at the grocery store was so long and I was traumatized. But, but I think that's partially because trauma is really just defined as a disruption of the life force. And it's something that happens to us. And in that moment, if we end up experiencing it as trauma, it's because we weren't able to cope. The experience overwhelmed our ability to strategize and engage with it. So part of me, just by virtue of being a human, understood that trauma was a big part of people's experiences. But particularly when you see how Western medical models try to address addiction, you just see a lot of failure. Well, that's the typical trope, right? Is you go to rehab, you do your time, you come out, you're clean for maybe a little while. Right. And then you repeat the cycle. Right. And, you know, we expect, you know, you know, relapse is a part of recovery. We absolutely expect that to be part of that life cycle. But, you know, addiction is such a psychosocial, spiritual uh, process. And I just found that we really weren't able to address that well with the very limited pharmaceuticals we have to treat substance use disorders outside of methadone or buprenorphine, also known as Suboxone. We don't have anything to treat methamphetamine use disorder, or cocaine use. We have medications for alcohol use disorder, but, um, you know, their efficacy is pretty limited if you actually look at the data. And, uh, and the same is true for mental health, right? When we get excited about a new uh, treatment in mental health, SSRIs were the last thing people got really hyped about. Their efficacy is about 40%. You know, it's really actually very limited. And what's so exciting about ketamine and what was really overwhelming to me at first was ketamine's efficacy for treatment-resistant depression in particular is about 70 to 75 percent. And that's what I found in my practice. Um, more so than any other moment in clinical medicine, I was finding that people were getting better in a much more reliable way. And that took a moment to orient around because it was just such a new experience. You're used to, you're used to a lot of failure, honestly. And so the turn towards ketamine, how did that arise? Was that just did that for come me out of, or yeah. within the, the no, zeitgeist? For you. I know that it's pretty recent, right? Within the past few years, people have started to notice. Oh, Definitely ketamine the last has few years, there's been like a huge shift. I feel like I kind of walked into the ketamine world right at that moment, um, just like a like a beat before it started to become really, really popular. Um, but for me, actually, my mentor Larry Lehman, who is a physician at the University of New Mexico, um, he and I have shared a background in just being in a lot of different transformational spaces and doing breath work together and both with long spiritual practices. And he was the one who really was like, come join me for this ketamine assisted psychotherapy training in Colorado um, with Prati, the Psychedelic Research Association and Training Institute, which is a really tremendous organization with just very good hearted, grounded people who've been in the psychedelic space for decades. And I was a little reticent. I felt busy. And, you know, still at that point, I was taking a lot of call at the hospital and was sort of like ketamine, my God, whatever. Okay, fine. I will go. It seems like there's some good evidence for this. 
And uh, it's an experiential training. So when you're there, you receive both an intramuscular injection. So you receive an IM session and a sublingual session. Um, those are two of the three routes that you can take ketamine, the other's IV. And of course, there is an intranasal spray and intranasal use is the most popular way that people use it in the community and the most common form of use that's associated with abuse. I was blown away. I did not expect ketamine to be the profound experience that it was. Um, I feel comfortable talking about personal use in a public domain, but I had um, not used psychedelics myself until my early 30s um, and had used psilocybin and ayahuasca prior to my ketamine experience and was sort of stunned because it felt like this was an intersection of these spiritual communities and spiritual worlds that I had been inhabiting for a long time with medicine in a way that uh, that felt safe and integrated and like this doesn't have to be this fringe thing that um, desperate or weird or eccentric people are using to use a lot of the stigmatizing language that is still in conventional wisdom and a lot of the public's mind. Uh, there's a way to bring a psychedelic process of working with your inner healer, of accessing inner intelligence to the greater public. And ketamine as a Schedule Three substance, which is legal to prescribe and use, really provides an avenue for that. What kind of breakthrough did you have when you did this? Yeah, I mean, for me specifically, um, in my intramuscular experience and my sublingual, I mean, I'll just talk about the content that came up for me because I think that's your question. I, I walked away with this theme that love is not equivalent to duty, that love is actually something that really involves a deeper expression of freedom for all parties. Um, I come from a long line of people who have substance use in their family and certainly have had a uh, a lot of time spent in codependent situations with work and with partners and friendships. And it was really the beginning for me of a filtering out of um, just certain relationships and certain ways of being in the world where I was showing up out of a sense of dependency and duty and responsibility and not actually showing up with um, authenticity and my own life force and vitality in full expression. And you said it felt like an intersection between ayahuasca and mushrooms? No, it felt like an intersection between sort of oh, the, the psychedelic space, right? Oh, okay. Like the sort of spiritual ceremonial space. Um, you know, psilocybin and ayahuasca are so serotonin heavy. So there's all these different neurotransmitters. One of the things that makes ketamine so interesting, and I think part of the reason it's actually so efficacious for people is because ketamine works with glutamate. And glutamate is this kind of godfather neurotransmitter that's excitatory in the nervous system. It causes the brain to release serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine um, downstream. And it also increases this peptide called BDNF, which is what helps with creating neuroplasticity. So what's so interesting about ketamine and part of the reason I think it is so fun to work with, particularly I've been focusing on substance use disorders, but also for complex PTSD or developmental trauma, and certainly for mood disorders that have been recalcitrant to treatment, is you're actually getting a chance to wash the brain with more BDNF, which gives the brain this, this window of opportunity to create new pathways and really start to create and feel things and just look at your life with a little bit more agency and a little bit more witness consciousness. Now, I mentioned the serotonin because psilocybin and ayahuasca are so associated with the classic psychedelic, lots of colors or geometric shapes. A lot of people won't necessarily see that on ketamine and certainly practicing in a place like Humboldt. I have lots of people who are struggling but are long-term recreational psychonauts. And one of the things they'll describe about ketamine is it's not like their experiences with psilocybin or ayahuasca um, or DMT. It's not this strong, lots of colors and fractals. Um, it might be kind of dark. Sometimes people have almost more like images or impressions that come to them. And for some people, they really are in um, a highly visual, non-ordinary state of consciousness. But uh, with the lack of like pure serotonergic upswing, you don't necessarily get the, the, the visual aspect. I've heard yeah. it's very almost third person -y. And that you're getting this outside perspective on your life as a whole. Oh, Nick, I love that. That's actually one of the things in the ways we describe it. So I like to say that it kind of kicks you into your witness consciousness. You end up in this place where you're observing yourself, your life, um, patterns of your own being, patterns intergenerationally. Uh, it's, it's really amazing to watch people just get a little bit more space and a little bit more breath. And so what are the 
results that you can expect from that? How long does the treatment? So you go through the treatment. How long are you carrying that through? So is this is actually a year. So it really depends. I've had people who have had one treatment and then they're like, oh, my gosh, that was it. I had this insight or I had this altered state or this high uh, attenuated moment. And now that was all I needed. And they kind of go about their daily lives and integrate it. For treatment-resistant depression, which is the most common thing that ketamine has been studied for, typically people get six exposures. Most of the evidence is using IV ketamine over a period of about four weeks. And then once they've had that, what the studies have shown is they've really only gone out to a period after the study of about six months, and a few have gone out to 12 months. So the evidence doesn't, this is all so new, and we repeat this all the time to our patients because this is new. We're at the cutting edge. We're all trying to balance the space between safety and sense and caution, as well as what seems to actually be working for you. Where is this medicine helping you come alive? Um, As long as people are avoiding side effects like elevated blood pressure or ketamine-induced cystitis or bladder pain and inflammation. I have had some people who stay on lozenge-based therapy after going through a series of intramuscular um, sessions in the office. Um, sometimes just doing one session a month, sometimes doing every other week. So I would say the follow-up part has been highly individualized, but for most people, they go through a series, four to eight exposures to the medicine in four to eight weeks, and then you look for psychotherapeutic support. You look to lean into that power that your inner healer, again, that's really what a psychedelic model is motivated towards. It's naming that you have this capacity within you to heal yourself and to stay connected to that. And that is just so different than an allopathic or Western model of medicine. And so the more we can connect people to that agency within themselves, I do find that they're able to um, last longer without needing a medicine treatment. And how effective is it? Is it like an 80% success rate? It's about 70 to 75%. 75%. That's mm-hmm. pretty good. It's really good. Compared to good. The, the treatments that they have otherwise, that's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. And especially where it's not, You're just relying on this pill to get you through the day. Absolutely. Then you go home, you sleep, and you take another pill tomorrow. You know, and I really appreciate you saying that because that's what's true for so many of our patients in particular. They have health beliefs and values that are just at odds with an allopathic psychopharmaceutical model, which, again, I became a physician, an osteopathic physician, but in part because there's a place for that. It's important to know that we have those things available, but there's so many people who just don't want that for themselves, and they want to know that they might be able to access something that doesn't involve using a pharmaceutical. And let's celebrate and honor and call in the benefits of those medications um, when they're used at times. It's interesting that psychedelics have had this, this awakening moment. They were underground for a long time, and now, I mean, you can go to your facility and take ketamine. Yeah. In a completely safe environment. And it's not illegal. You can go get ketamine. Yeah. How crazy is that? It, it is a little wild that this is happening, but I also think it's in part because, as I'm sure you and a lot of your listeners know, there was this moment where there was a lot of research happening around LSD, around psilocybin, um, a little bit around DMT as well, and some around ketamine. What's lovely about ketamine is because it's been classified as a Schedule Three substance, we have been able to continue to do research with it. Unlike um, MDMA, another substance around which there was a lot of research, and there's been resurgence around um, thanks to MAPS and their very, very diligent work around continuing to get um, FDA approval for clinical trials for MDMA, specifically for PTSD, as well as for generalized anxiety disorder. And the truth is that these medications or experiences are have been more effective than a lot of the current treatments and treatment modalities, at least that have been studied. And I think you can only suppress that for so long. And the other part of this is from a, a model that in the substance use world we would call harm reduction, which instead of cutting someone off from treatment altogether because they're not willing to be 100% abstinent, the idea is that you meet someone where they are. The truth is people were already using these substances and working with these substances on their own. I actually see a fair number of people who come to see me to talk about how they've been microdosing psilocybin, which just as a general note, most people are macrodosing their microdosing. Like that seems to be something I'm, I'm getting a lot of calls about all the time. And I'm like, 
Well, if you're feeling that altered, I, I think it's no longer a microdose. So that's that's really... If you're taking two grams, it's not really a microdose. Yeah, it's not really a microdose yeah. at that point. Yeah, if you're actively hallucinating at work, it's no longer a microdose. So again, just general public announcement there. Um, but a lot of people are already using these substances. So being able to talk about them safely with a physician and with a therapist, with people who can actually help sort of guide that experience... Um, it really does make a difference. And I think it will help people use these substances, which again, they are already using in a way that has the potential to be not just safer, but more transformative for them. That's one of the interesting things about what you guys are doing is that you have that therapeutic aspect to it. You don't really find that with psilocybin. That's just, oh, you just take some mushrooms, hang out with your friends, and you'll be okay. But with ayahuasca, especially, you need the shaman. That's the big thing. And now with ketamine, you have a ther- is it just a therapist? Is there a trauma therapist? How does that work yeah, out? Yeah, so there, and there's different models, too. I mean, there are, um, you know, for us in far northern California, there's an IV ketamine infusion clinic in Redding, and there's one in Tahoe. And these are clinics where you, you go and you receive an IV, and you're often in a room with other people, and there isn't necessarily a sitter or someone who's there designated to be with you and offer a guided container to the experience. And that is a perfectly fine model model that's using the psychopharmaceutical benefits of ketamine, right? So we know that it's increasing glutamate. They're still getting the benefits of neuroplasticity. What I have created instead is is really a model that's more infused with um, psychotherapy and, and, and trauma therapy in particular at its base. So the idea is that you're creating relational safety with the, the clinician or the provider that you're meeting with, and that when you have a guided session... It is really different to enter an altered state knowing that there is a non-altered person, first of all, with you, that you have had your blood pressure checked so that one of the few things that is um, a risk with ketamine use has been accounted for. You've likely received anti-nausea medicine because ketamine can make people feel very nauseous, just like other psychedelics can. And I've had people who have used a lot of substances, both ceremonially and intentionally, as well as recreationally. And they come in for their ketamine process, and they are stunned by how deep they've been able to go, how much more that when they're truly in this expanded state, they've been able to surrender, to just really let themselves unfold and experience things that have been deeply buried. Do you, think, do you attribute that to having that? I think it's the relational there? safety. I do. And so the, the people in our practice, there's myself, a therapist, Melissa Sandin, um, our nurse practitioner, Mariel Bosserman. And then we have a new therapist, uh, Jane Moran. So it's going to be one or two, depending on the patient and the client and their needs, um, of us who's with the people during their session. For IV sessions, Randy Litton, who's our, um, our nurse manager, is with people the entire time. And so even since opening, we've had people who, it turns out, have been flying to L.A. monthly to get IV ketamine. That's got to rack up. I had no idea that there were people in Humboldt flying to L.A. for IV ketamine treatments have shown up. And it's been really lovely to receive feedback from them that this has been such a different experience, that they feel really held and that it feels like it's a beautiful space to be in. And Randy has gotten sort of expressions of shock every time they say, you're going to be here with me the whole time instead of like leaving and coming back. And, um, and, and that just feels really lovely to be able to offer that to people. Are they taking a more passive role and just being there should something arise or are they actively trying to guide you and steer you into where you need to go? Yeah, it's such a good question. So for the psychotherapy sessions, it's two and a half hours with a clinician and we check in for anywhere from 20 to 60 minutes for the first part. And at that part, we've already had you really kind of name what your therapeutic intention is for yourself, what it is that you're wanting, which for people, especially if they've experienced developmental trauma, is an incredibly vulnerable thing right? To open up to some longing, some state that you want to experience for yourself. So we're often reconnecting to that therapeutic contract or intention and then seeing what's alive for them today, seeing what other kinds of um, fear or anxiety or excitement may have bubbled up before they kind of transition into the medicine space for the first time. After that period of check-in, there's just some practical things that happen. You should empty your bladder because ketamine will often make you feel like you need to urinate even if you don't. And we take your blood pressure, we give you anti-nausea medicines, we get you set up with headphones, check the volume for those, and eye shades. Um, So it is really meant to be an experience where your senses are drawing in and, again, trying to activate and connect to that inner healing intelligence and that innate sense of agency. 
Um, after that, we do a guided meditation. And especially for the first few sessions, there's um, essentially trip instructions. They're called um, this. It's oh, what is their formal name? Flight instructions. And they're common. I like that. Yeah. Flight instructions. Yeah. They're, they're common in the psychedelic community. And it's kind of a combination of verbiage from Stanislav Grof and Rick Doblin and a lot of the sort of bigger names in the psychedelic world. And they're just instructions meant, again, to these general principles. I know that I'm circling around the same themes, but that's because they're such powerful ones and they serve as portals to transformational experience. Um, these are words that are all about surrendering and opening to whatever comes in your journey, even if it's nothing. There are times where there's just nothing there. But I think we experience that in our day-to-day -day lives at times, too, and it can be deeply uncomfortable. So being able to be in whatever state might come after that, you receive your injection. And then people at, at that dosing are often in a pretty nonverbal state. Not all the time. Sometimes they're talking. We're writing. If you're saying a lot of things, we are keeping a record of that so that we can share that with you afterwards and you have that. And um, around, so the medicine itself is about a 20 to 45 minute experience. We give most people a, a booster to expand the kind of Duration. peak of the experience. Okay. Yeah around 15 to 20 minutes. And uh, that often makes it more like 45 to 60 minutes. And then we're guiding you back as you kind of start to land. And then it's really different. And I would say it's different for people with each journey. Some people land and they are ready to say, oh my gosh, I just saw my grandmother and she told me this. And then this dog turned into a dolphin or whatever it might be. And then we're sort of exploring what does that image mean for you? What does that symbol mean for you? Two of us in the practice are trained as somatic psychotherapists, and we're often pretty interested in where do you feel that in your body? How is your nervous system responding to that image that just came up? And we're integrating for the remainder of the time. And then 24 hours later, you check in with one of the members of our staff. And for a lot of people, they're scheduled with either one of us or their primary therapist, if they already have a therapist whom they're seeing, um, within 24 to 48 hours to, again, just help support the neuroplasticity that's come up in the first um, the first two days in particular after a ketamine experience. So nonverbal. The, the idea that comes to mind is K-hole. Is that kind of what it is? Yeah. I mean, K-hole sounds so pejorative, right? It doesn't sound great. <laughs> are you going into a K-hole? That doesn't sound exactly. somewhere you want to be. Exactly. I mean, be. I sort of get the image of us like poking people and being like, are you there yet? Yeah, are you there back. yet? Have you, you know, stay in your K-hole. Um, or is that a higher dose? It, when it's you'd often a higher dose. So just for frame of reference, when we're using ketamine um, in the hospital for procedural sedation or for general anesthesia, the dosing that you're using is more like three to eight milligrams per kilogram. The dosing you're using for any kind of mental health or ketamine-assisted psychotherapy indication is 0.5 to 1.2 milligrams Oh, so significantly per lower. Much lower. Okay. One of the beautiful things about ketamine is that it doesn't affect your heart rate or your respiratory rate. It doesn't affect your drive to breathe. Most medicines you would get for anesthesia, the reason you are on a ventilator is because they are turning off your drive to breathe. And ketamine doesn't have that effect. It does have just this transient increase of your blood pressure of about 20 points. Um, while you're using it. So, and even that is a pretty short duration. And so if you were to go into a K-hole, would you be closer to that sedative? A dose? little bit more to that that closer place, but it is a dissociative experience. And so for people who have strong dissociation tendencies, if that's a large part of the behavior and way of relating to themselves that they've been using in order to survive life and its vicissitudes of suffering, um, that's something we talk about really plainly is how will it be for you to potentially enter a dissociative state? Is that a fear with certain mental health ailments like bipolar? That's the big one that you hear in regards to psychedelics is that it can ignite something that might be there. So for ketamine for bipolar depression is actually a great treatment. Oh, it is? Yeah. For, okay. for, for when people are in bipolar depression, um, I've actually had some, some great results with people. There really are not good studies at this point on ketamine and bipolar depression. I'm a part of several large ketamine clinician groups where we're all frequently sharing cases and consultation. And um, bipolar depression during that period, ketamine can be very helpful with guidance and awareness and checking in and screening really closely for mania. For people who have had uh, manic episodes that tend towards psychosis or for people who have diagnoses of schizophrenia or schizoaffective, so um, a primary psychotic disorder in conjunction with the mood disorder, 
you know, I, at this point, because again, I'm boarded in family medicine, addiction medicine. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm very clear about telling people that. Um, my nurse practitioner is a psychiatric nurse practitioner who is in certification, and we're very likely bringing on another psychiatric nurse practitioner. So we have good psych background. None of us would be using ketamine for people who have primary psychotic disorders. So that's that's really, and that's true in terms of the study guidelines that have been used to rule in or rule people out for all of the different kinds of psychedelic medicine trials that have been taking place. That's true for MDMA. That's true for psilocybin. Um, that's been true for the DMT studies. Yeah, I've so heard that, that especially yeah. with marijuana, is that if you take high doses and you have that inclination towards psychosis, it can just push you over the edge. It can. It can. And I have to be honest, that's something I had not seen reliably until I came to Humboldt. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Is yeah. that just because you're closer with it now? Or? I, I think there's just cannabis use, you know, and I'll, for a frame of reference, I went to medical school in Virginia, did my residency in Maine at Maine Dartmouth, and then did fellowship in New Mexico at the University of New Mexico. And there just isn't a cannabis culture in the same way as there is in Humboldt yeah, compared we have a pretty, to any of the We have places. a pretty strong it's, one. It's very different. And there's such higher use. And I was especially seeing when I was still doing some primary care at United Indian Health, um, saw adolescents using cannabis at very high doses very early and developing some psychotic disorders or more kind of hallucinatory tendencies with that use, particularly during that neurodevelopmental period. Is that the big factor is if you're under, what is it, 25 or 26 where your brain's still developing and you're using it that might push you closer than if you were older? I, certainly, yes. We do know that cannabis use in, in earlier um, ages and during certain developmental periods is more likely to be associated with mood disorders, including bipolar disorder, as well as including um, bipolar with mania and psychosis or schizophrenia. Um, no, it's not a given, and there's so many genetic factors that are at play here as well. So it's possible that cannabis use at a certain Age may unmask or may um, make certain genetic proclivities more likely to express themselves. But there can be someone who maybe hasn't used substances at all, but has that kind of genetic underpinning, uses them heavily in their 30s or 40s, and may still have the same response. Yeah, that's what I've always struggled with is it doesn't seem like you can really tell yet. Are you just predisposed to that? And then the cannabis pushes you over the edge? Would you have already gone there had you not used cannabis? Or is the cannabis causing that in some way? No, Nick, you are sitting in the ambiguity of this. Yeah. So well. Which sucks. You would like to yes. have it be black and white. Like, don't use cannabis before this age, and you're going to be fine. And right. if you do, then maybe you're, you know. Yeah, maybe you're. Gonna, yeah, maybe we don't know gonna what's going to happen. Something. Yeah. yeah. You know, even in, um, you know, in the addiction medicine world, you know, we, we really actually sort of say that you can't actively diagnose a mood disorder. Um, until someone has been substance-free for at least 30 days. Um, so particularly, a great example would be methamphetamine-induced psychosis. Super common for people to use high doses of meth, have psychotic states while intoxicated, and once they are no longer on meth, never have an episode of psychosis again. So I will say we have treated people who've been in recovery from a stimulant use disorder and have had episodes of psychosis while they were using and treated those people with ketamine without any concern because that's just such a different neurochemical framework for the reason they had psychosis in the first place. Wow. Yeah, that's that's the psychosis is the one that always freaks me out yeah. when you hear about that. Especially what comes up for you when you hear psychosis. Yeah, I it's not great. I always think of the homeless guy wandering the streets, screaming into the void, and you're like, oh, this guy did some drug and it just fried his brain. And I'm sure some of that is just programming. Because I grew up in the age where all drugs were bad. Psychedelic, mm. it didn't matter. There was yeah. no distinguishing psychedelics versus speed or heroin. It's all bad. Yeah. All drugs are bad. And then now you start to unpack that and you're like, well, MDMA, people are using that to treat PTSD. Psilocybin's helping people with depression. Ketamine's helping people with depression. Yeah. Not all drugs are the same. Well, you know, it's such a... We, we went through a phase, right, where all substances were stigmatized. But the truth is people have been using substances forever for the forever. entire duration of human history and primarily for uses or reasons that fall into two categories. And one is to feel better, right? One is to like have an expanded state, to have an experience of more pleasure, more joy, more creativity. One could even argue that the coffee that I have with me is part of me like increasing my alertness. Your We're both fancy energy drink is doing something similar. 
And then they also use drugs to or substances to to try and feel not just to enhance the pleasure, but to transform a state of suffering. And, and these uses of substances are so much older than than we think. And and you know, we've codified substances in ways in a really short period of time. I mean, you could get tincture of morphine at a pharmacy at the beginning of the 1900s, right? And and now um, people can be in severe pain. And after the confluence of the pharmaceutical industry and the medical industry um, leading to the opioid crisis, now, you know, physicians and providers of all stripes are afraid to prescribe opioids to anyone, even if there might be a really good clinical indication for a short-term course of an opioid. So our, our experiences about these substances, we change, but we, we often remain in judgment about them. And I would just generally recommend, I, I forget, frankly, that people experience stigma. I had a patient recently say she stopped seeing her therapist because she's been doing really well um, with a series of, she has developmental trauma disorder. And so particularly for people who have longstanding trauma and not a mood disorder, um, I'll often recommend sessions spaced out more because we're working with such longstanding content. You really want to give space for what may come up to um, integrate. And her therapist said, I can't work with you if you're going to continue to use a horse tranquilizer. And I was so stunned. I forgot that that's how people commonly think of this. And it's good for me to get out of my sort of neutral no substance is good or bad. It's all in how you're relating to it. Different things work for people at different times. And recognize that there's still a lot of stigma and judgment. And um, all of that is being projected onto the psychedelic space now, too. Do you have a lot of people reach out that are still hesitant? Yes. Just are trying to get information, but they, they're not really all in yet? Absolutely. Well, and a lot of people who've never... I mean, Humboldt, I think, is such an interesting place to have a psychedelic practice in because you either have people who come in and are like, I've done every psychedelic that's ever yeah. existed. Yeah, ketamine's light. But I'm still suffering and sort of working with that. So there's that end of the spectrum. And then there's people who've never used any substances and who carry that same fear that you just described. They're like, what if I do this and I become um, unhoused and wandering the streets or it unmasks some deep inner psychotic disorder I didn't know I carried? And... Often for those people, um, there, it takes a lot more preparation. You know, maybe we do, the, the process is generally you get medically cleared, and then you go through one or a series of preparation sessions to prepare you for entering a non-ordinary state of consciousness. For people who have never done that, whether it's through a non-substance-induced form, meditation, yoga, breath work, um, or if it hasn't been through a substance either, they can get very overwhelmed and appropriately at the idea of melting your consciousness and then returning and what might happen after that. Does ketamine have the idea of the ego death attached to it like psilocybin does? Is that along it the does. Same path? You can absolutely have an ego death experience on ketamine. I had a ketamine session last fall. I was working with a, um, a therapist in training and um, allowed her to sit for me. And actually thought I was dead. I thought I was dead for the entire time, um, right until I was landing. And I was like, I'm in Eureka, California. Oh, my God, I'm completely alive. I, but truly, it was total ego death. And uh, it was honestly a really beautiful experience. But, but it, was a, it was also just good as a, as a teaching moment for me to recognize this is how this kind of ego death can, can feel. Um, I had experienced different versions of that through my meditation practice and um, certainly during my, I've only used ayahuasca once in ceremony, um, but certainly in that ceremony as well. And uh, it's, it's a good thing to talk about and prepare people for because the complete melting of self and identity is uh, not something people necessarily experience on a day-to-day -day basis. And American culture is so devoted to um, who are you, what do you do? What uh, external factors can I glean about you so that I can put you into a box and understand who you are? We are such an externalized culture that this kind of work that is about digging deep within yourself, um, connecting to states, um, ways of being as opposed to uh, behaviors or externalized changes, uh, it, it's, a, it's a big difference. And I'm sure a lot of people are listening to that hearing you talk about your ego dying and thinking, why would I want to do that? Why yeah, would that's I? appropriate. And that's a crazy, <laughs> but it's a crazy thought because, I mean, I'm sitting here thinking, wow, that sounds amazing. Yeah. Like to kill off your ego, <laughs> who wouldn't want to do that? Yeah. But you have, we get so attached to what yeah. we think we are and who we think we are and a certain way of thinking and a certain pattern of beliefs that the idea of 
separating yourself from that really causes a pause in a lot of people. Yeah. And it's interesting hearing you describe it. I felt much more able to connect with the innate fear, like a primal fear that really is there and in that process. For well, you're losing for a part people. of yourself. Yeah. You were actively killing off a part of you, hopefully for something better to take its place. Yeah. Well, and, and I think, you know, part of the way we, we talk about it, too, is that, uh, you know, the inherent role or the the part, you know, there's I'm an internal family systems. One, one of the models of therapy that I've been learning is internal family systems, where you talk about how there's a whole self, a core self. And then there's all these different parts that we create. And, and Freud might say those parts are another way of talking about the ego. And then the idea is that the parts are never bad, um, but they're not the self. They're not the whole of who you are. The parts all have jobs. And it can be really disorienting if the part that is uh, like the exhausted martyr and who's just like, I will do this because no one else can do it as well as me. And I must just continue to be the hardest working person in this room or all the time, et cetera. If that part suddenly melts and goes through a death, what do you do and how do you kind of reintegrate that energy and that life force that was wrapped up in that particular way of being? And that question is really what psychedelic integration is about. So part of the reason we are really committed to a model that involves checking in with you at a bare minimum the next day, as well as seeing you in the office, making sure that your therapist is on board with treatment and understands some of the ways that integration work is different than other forms of therapy, is because of this exact thing we're talking about. If you go through an experience like an ego death, if a part of yourself comes up and asks for appreciation, integration, healing, it does really help to have some co-regulation, to have another person to witness that process instead of feeling like this part has been fractured, cut open, broken open, and now I don't even know who I am or what to do with myself. Yeah, that would be traumatizing, especially if you're alone and you do this you have this breakthrough and then you're just sitting in a dark room listening to music and you're like, oh, shit, I right. just went through this. Oh, Nick, you said it so well. I mean, I initially started with a model that was only intramuscular in the office and then partially because access became an issue to treatment um, because at that time there was really only one of me and I was still taking a lot of call at the hospital and working lots of other places um, as well as people who'd been through treatment. But sort of wanted to see if lozenges could offer some support in between experiences or kind of for ongoing, um, you know, glutamate enhancement, um, I started using lozenges at home, but have some pretty strict criteria around who can do that safely. And for people who don't have good social support at home, who don't feel emotionally safe in their home, and certainly, of course, if people don't have physical safety around them, home lozenge ketamine therapy is not a good option. And typically when we reach a point in a consult where I'm like, I hear you saying that you're interested in home therapy with ketamine. And I just want to mirror back to you all of these things you've shared with me that make me think that you melting your brain and your heart and your whole being in the in the comfort of your house uh, doesn't seem like a great idea. Probably people, not the best. People generally get that if they've reached a point where they've shared enough about their their lives and and what's happening in them. And, you know, I haven't had someone push back about that yet. But yeah, especially if you're unpacking that trauma aspect. Yeah. It might be beneficial to bounce ideas off of somebody yeah. as you're going through that. Yeah. I mean, we are social creatures. We were designed to to be in in tribe and community with each other. And one of the things that um we talk about in polyvagal theory or this certain aspect of somatic therapy is co-regulation. You know, we need other people's nervous systems. That's actually part of not just how we survive, but how we thrive together, how we actually really learn how to grow and change and work together. And when you're dealing with um, such raw material that's often oriented around a false identity of shame, I mean, speaking of ego death, that's often what people sort of need to have die, right, is these false identities that are connected to a core sense of shame. And nonetheless, even when we lose that identity and that sense of I am not shame, I am interconnected with all beings, I am joy, I am bliss, I am peace, Integrating that is a process in and of itself. I mean, bliss can feel absolutely terrifying. Do you think that's a lot of what ego is, is shame? I haven't heard that before. I think. Or it's a portion of it. Yeah. I mean, I, I would not say that all of ego is shame. Part of where I'm naming that from is really from this model of therapy called NARM or neuroaffective relational model. 
And in NARM, we talk about how people who've experienced developmental trauma, so chronic misattunement or environmental failures in caregiving during their early developmental years, it, in that model with complex PTSD, the core identity that gets formed is around a sense of shame, is around this fundamental sense that I must be bad. Because when you're a child and if your caregiver isn't able to meet your needs, it's frankly safer to internalize a sense that I must be the problem and not my parent or my caregiver just literally isn't able to meet my needs. That's far too threatening a realization for a child to have. Well, and it makes sense, right? Because your ego, oftentimes you're trying to compensate for something. You have this yeah. big bravado sense of self. It's probably because you feel small in this one area or you're you're ashamed about this one area, right? Absolutely. So we track, it just caught me off guard. I've never heard it related to shame in that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and another way to think about it, you know, through internal family systems is that we create these parts, right? And these parts are doing all these things for us to prevent us from feeling what in that model they term exiles or sort of wounded states, which are often shame, sadness. Do people often find that they can have better relationships after undergoing ketamine? That's attributed to psilocybin, right? As you you can kind of you MDMA, love more. actually in particular oh, MDMA is, the, too, is yeah. the empathogen that sort of really in particular seems to connect to more sort of heart centeredness. You know, there are some people who are starting to use ketamine for couples work in particular. This is not a place that I've explored. I, I think that where ketamine ketamine is is very as as you named that third party perspective, that observer, that witness. It, it doesn't have the same kind of heartful energy that MDMA in particular seems to kind of crack open. And just by virtue of entering a non-ordinary state of consciousness, there's such tremendous potential for change and transformation there that, of course, it could lead to change in one's relationship with themselves and in their relationships otherwise. But certainly the within the psychedelic world, the general thrust of the medication that might be best suited for that kind of work is generally MDMA. Ketamine is more, that might be an after effect of you going inside yourself, not an explicit one like through MDMA. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's so many different ones. I think ketamine is, ketamine used to be PCP or is PCP, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's so great. That, People isn't don't that usually crazy? know that. So I they're the same that. class of drugs, right? So PCP and ketamine are, are similar in their chemical formations. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. I, when wild. I was growing up, PCP <laughs> was the what is it, bath salts predecessor, you would hear, oh, somebody right. is going crazy or they're, you know, they got shot three times by a police officer and they're still going after the cop. Yes. Oh, yeah, they're on PCP or, oh, yeah, they're on bath salts. Yeah. Nick, and where did you grow up? Here. Okay. So yeah. I, I had, I was, I wouldn't say I was sheltered, but when I was younger, I had this very cut and dry view of drugs are bad. Anybody yeah. that does drugs is not a good person. You're not going far in life. I was very, you know, I was raised Catholic, yeah. and so I was just in that box of yeah. you just write everybody off that participates in that path, and then you get older, and you you start branching out, and you say, oh, yeah, this life is not this cut and dry thing. Yeah. You can't put all these people in this box because they do this thing. You start unraveling those threads, right? I think that's what happened hopefully, for me. Yeah. Hopefully. Hopefully you Some people don't, the and then- <laughs> They're like this sounds 80, like very appropriate growth. Yeah, so. they're 80 years old and they're still in that line of thinking. And yeah. It's not, that's not where you want to be. I think life has a way of generally breaking down black and white thinking over time. If it's not something that we're sort of choosing to take the reins of and do internally, it, it just feels like you get offered or slammed with experiences that sort of force you to reckon with that kind of thinking. I think the slamming is head the sl on. The slamming Normally it's a painful like process it. and you you run into a brick wall and it's... Yeah. Well, I can either keep running into the brick wall or maybe I go around it yeah. and then you get a little better. Or maybe you use ketamine and the brick wall isn't even there anymore. Yeah, the brick wall <laughs> melts away and then you just keep walking. <laughs> did you have any of that where you did come from kind of this medical community of, yes, psychedelics or not? It's just a fool science or we shouldn't really be looking because that's still the stigma, right? No, I think that stigma is still there, Present. frankly. Um you know, I think that part of it has to do with, with you know, and I keep going back to this, but there's a lot of tension between a psychedelic model of there's an inner healer within all beings and there's inner healing intelligence and a healing process involves connecting people to that versus an allopathic model, which says that disease is caused by, you know, 
inflammation and infection and different external sources. And so even just sitting with that, here's this model that's like the work is within, and here's this model that says the causes of suffering are without. And so our solutions need to be on ways that combat um, these external sources. And um, and then I'm actually an osteopathic physician, and osteopathy came from a man named Andrew Taylor Still, who was a physician in the Civil War, lost four of his children to meningitis. This was a time that was before antibiotics. And uh, Actually, people didn't even know what bacteria was. So he was devastated by why has this happened? And the tools that I've learned, which in that time were, were like bloodletting and purging and blistering and, and things that we would think of as so barbaric now. Though I always question some of the things we do now that we might end up thinking are barbaric by the end of my career in a handful of decades, hopefully. But he ended up actually forming this philosophy of osteopathy, which involves treating the structure of the body with the idea that the body has an innate healing intelligence and knows how to heal itself if we're able to get the anatomy to move. So he really started to work with the idea of how structure equates to function and functioning of the body. And that if we can just get the structure of the body working well, that the functioning will begin to thrive and take care of itself. But so I mentioned that because osteopathy, one, was kind of my first love. I was a yoga teacher and yoga therapist before I went to medical school. I didn't necessarily think this would be my path. Um, but there's all these tensions in the philosophies of these models. And um, even as a person who at the time was teaching yoga classes and doing some individual yoga therapy with people, I, I still felt like I wanted to integrate this more mainstream world because there's times where you really just need an antibiotic, right? And like that is a wonderful thing that we have available to people. Modern medicine can save your life. It's incredible what we do. Um, but we, we've gone so all in to this side of the, the world that we've lost some of the magic, some of the mystery, um, you know, and some of the beauty of really helping empower people to recognize that they do have a lot of inner wisdom that they may be able to access, particularly when it comes, I think, to mental health struggles. Do you think that the rise in psychedelics and almost the rise in homeopathic medicine is attributed to people? feeling failed by Western medicine? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think there's a ton of backlash. And so you see this huge shift towards um, complementary and alternative medicine, towards um, older healing traditions. I think it's in large part, too, because, you know, a Western medical model doesn't necessarily train people to, to hear those things or to honor those things. Um, in Western medicine, we're focused on evidence. A randomized controlled trial is the gold standard of evidence. And we don't have a lot of randomized controlled trials of these other ways of practicing medicine, in part because they're not funded. And this is where you just you have to look at the structures in which we're practicing, right? Physicians and advanced practice clinicians of all stripes are also so incredibly overwhelmed. And it is, as a person who's now really working 70% just for myself and in my own practice, but still feels important and like I want it's important to me and I want to be involved in the community so I still do work where I go out to Kamau or on the Hoopa Reservation once a month and do prenatal care and women's health and still do per diem work at Open Door and United Indian Health um you know those feel really important to me and when I go back into this model where it's like right I'm gonna see 10 to 12 patients in a half day and that's just what I'm doing and this is not what I've been able to create myself where I have an hour with people and there's time to really slow down and feel and hear what's important to folks. When you're stuck in this model and this is what you're doing day in and day out, how on earth could you have a conversation about someone's deeper fears? Or um, if someone talks to you about a homeopathic remedy that you don't know something about, it's easy to be like, sure, I don't know, use it. Or maybe it's easier to be dismissive. But um, I have a ton of compassion and empathy for people who are practicing medicine because it is really, really hard to do it at the tempo that the medical industry requires us to do it. Well, the system's not, it's not designed to be preventative. It's designed for you to come in with a problem. They fix the problem either temporarily or however that pans out. And then you go back out into the world. So whatever caused that problem is still there. Right. And you just keep putting a bandaid on it. Right. Secondary prevention, tertiary prevention. That's really what tends to happen here. And Again, it's wonderful that that exists so that when you fracture your femur, like 
perfect. Yeah, that is a great If you break a leg, moment. you can go and they're going to patch you up. Yes, which is a wonderful thing. If you are septic, we have antibiotics, we have fluids, we can resuscitate you. If you have a heart attack, we have defibrillators, we have epinephrine. These are wonderful, amazing things. They definitely don't get to the root cause of why you had that heart attack and why you have the hyperlipidemia and all those other pieces. But it's good that they exist. Yes, it's good that they exist. I think you're right in that the balance has just tilted so far in one direction for so long that people have kind of stopped looking to the right? other side. Well, and then they're so fraught. I mean, patients tell me stories of things that providers have said to them, which are horrifying and are shocking to me that a uh, that someone would would be you know, allegedly so dismissive or blunt or curt or even the the mini anecdote I shared about the person's therapist who was like, I cannot work with you if you are using horse tranquilizers to heal yourself. I'm like, oh, God, I, I forget that we can be so um, just quick to judge and quick to stigmatize as opposed to particularly, and I, I keep going back to the model of substance use just because my roots are so in addiction medicine. People are not using substances if they're not receiving some benefit from them. There's something that alcohol, even if it has rendered you unhoused and without your relationships, is giving to you. So being curious about that for someone, just acknowledging and naming for them, hey, you're continuing to use fentanyl, and, and there must be a reason for that. So what, what is that? What is fentanyl providing for you? And, and offering that kind of curiosity instead of, um, what is wrong with you? We need to get you into detox. It's going to be really hard to de detox you off fentanyl because it just is hard to detox people off fentanyl and kind of already sort of worrying the patient down what the treatment train and plan would be without really getting curious about why, why is this happening for you? Like, what, what, is this, what is this giving to you in addition to what it's taking from you? The fentanyl one is scary, especially Fentanyl's now scary. where it's just, it seems so rampant everywhere. You know, Fentanyl is terrifying, and I just want to be really clear. Drugs are not safe. People should not use drugs that they get unless you fentanyl test them nowadays. And I'll be very, very frank. I um, have had a patient recently who struggled with varied substance use disorders. They used what they thought was a Xanax from a friend, and I am fairly confident that they actually over, you know, had a, they, they were out for 24 hours. And I, I don't think that was Xanax. <laughs> I mean, I just I think that there's fentanyl laced into everything right now. And um, it's it's a really terrifying time to use substances. What do you make of the decriminalization movement? Do you think that drugs should be decriminalized, that people should have access to it? Is you know, it a fine line we have to walk? You know, I, I think there's, of course, fine lines to walk. But I, as part of a um, master's of public health certificate at the University, University of New Mexico, I did a deep dive into um, Portugal's system and, and other systems that use a harm reduction approach um, that's focused on decriminalization. and through reading about how other systems, particularly other justice systems, work with substances, wow, are we doing this so wrong? It's really kind of a horrifying thing to see. Um, but overall, I think decriminalization is actually a really important movement. I think it matches what is authentic and is happening, which is people are already using substances. So how do we offer guidance about how to do that safely? And I think a lot of the behaviors that are associated with everything from human trafficking to, um, you know, physical assault to murder, all of these things that happen when you suppress something into this shadow industry, um, those would likely lessen if we had decriminalization and um, more, you know, if the legal consequences weren't so severe, let alone the fact that uh, the way that substance use is um, or even drug commerce is uh, adjudicated is so racist in this nation um, that, you know, we have been using, you know, drugs and, you know, marijuana possession to keep people of color incarcerated for periods of time that are absolutely, um, th there's no other word for it other than oppressive. That's the big thing with Coke and crack, right? Is Coke is the white man's drug and then crack you can use to lock up minority groups. Right, right. I mean... It's how old are you? Do you mind me asking? I'm 25. You're 25. You're 25. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I think of the the sort of like cocaine and, and crack as being um, like very much right part of the 90s and, and this uh, way of delineating like here's who's using these substances versus here's who's using these substances. But you're right. We think about these substances really differently based on who we think is using them. Do you buy into the idea that if we decriminalized more people would do drugs? Do you think they'd kind of stay the same? I don't 
don't actually think that that's true. I don't and, either, and but I don't have that, anything to back that up. That is a totally up. gestalt yeah. answer. I, I don't have any evidence to support that. And I know you could get some really amazing people who are deep in the decriminalization movement on here who could probably cite evidence. And But, but my gut sense is, no, I really don't think that it would actually lead to this pervasive drug use. Um, I, I think it would lead to safer use. And, and again, I'm, I'm so rooted in a harm reduction model of care that to me, that is such a big benefit. If we're able to have substances that are safe, um, that in and of itself would prevent all of these unnecessary and unanticipated fentanyl overdoses that are happening. And that's the big thing, right? What are we trying to do? Are right. we trying to just keep drugs out of people's hands, knowing that they're probably still going to do drugs, but they might do drugs that now kill them? Or do we want to maybe allow those same people that would do drugs to do clean drugs? Where well, do we stand with that? You know, I was really interested in uh, what would it have been? I guess winter of 2020 was when there was, um, you know, this amendment to shut down Hatcher's needle exchange program. Were you familiar with this at I'm all? I'm familiar or? with the Hatcher program. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I came to two city council meetings and, and spoke about why it's so important to have, you know, safe injection sites. And, you know, not that that is what Hatcher offers. There is no safe injection site in Humboldt County or generally, but needle exchange. And I was shocked listening to citizens about how upset they were about finding. And of course, no one is excited to find needles or syringes in public parks or in your neighborhood. But the amount of judgment that was being cast upon um, Hatcher and, and the model of harm reduction and of people who use substances was honestly, it took my breath away. I, I And again, I think I, I'm so in my world of... Um, psychedelic assisted therapy and harm reduction models and, uh, you know, endless neutrality around substances because it's, it's really more about mitigating the effects for a singular person in their lives. And in, in my sort of one-to-one -one clinical model of care, uh, I, I was completely taken aback and really sad that they ultimately, um, and I apologize that I'm not remembering the details of it now, but, but ultimately the amendment passed to, to stop the the needle exchange part of their services. I think Hatcher was struggling. I think they had some other problems going on around I'm there. I'm confident that the narrative is more uh, Complex. nuanced than I, yeah. I'm aware of. But I think the needle aspect is a problem in that, no, you're right, nobody wants to see needles littering everywhere. Right. right. And I think one of the ways that you might be able to mitigate that is doing the exchange in a safe injection site where you don't just let them take the needle and go, they have to bring their drugs right. and shoot on site. And then you could control the needles at least. But then people hear that and they're like, oh, you're promoting drug, you're right. letting that them do drugs in this spot. It's still so wild for people, but countries who actually have spaces like that, like I was in Copenhagen a million years ago now, it feels like, like 2002 or three, And even at that point, they actually had safe injection sites. And you don't see needles on the street. And people actually have a safe place to go. The, those centers also connect people with um, recovery resources if or when they want them. It's a way of touching base. It's actually, it creates community. And one of the biggest antidotes to substance use disorders is frankly connection. Um, I'm not encouraging, say, I want to be super clear to anyone listening to this. I'm not encouraging that like everyone should go use substances together, but there's a way to meet people where they are and offer safety that doesn't condone use necessarily. Um, and again, it's just non-inherently shaming, which is so much of how addiction services are rendered, is that the addict is bad, that they are just a bad person. Um, and that's not true. Well, we do these weird gymnastics with it because we allow these testings to occur at like music festivals, like yeah. EDM festivals. You can go test your drugs because they know you're going to do drugs. Right. And so you can go test them. But then if you took you took that and put it into a public sphere where maybe homeless people are using this instead of college kids, now it's bad. Right. Now we have a problem with no, it. Now Nick, it needs to you're, change. You're killing it, right? Like you're, you're very much, that's a perfect structural analysis of how we've decided that for these people, mostly white privileged people, this is fine and appropriate. And this is good. It's good that we keep them safe. But why would we think of offering the same kind of safety services to people who might be um, oppressed structurally in lots of different domains? Or even just we value it at a different level in that they've already thrown away their lives. They're living on the streets. Ugh, yeah. They're homeless. 
they no, made, you're right. They made their bed, and now we're going to let them yeah. lie in it. God. Ugh. It sucks. Yeah, it sucks. It just it, it hurts. It hurts to hear you say it, and you're totally right. It hurts in part because it is so, so true. Do you think we'll ever get to a time where psychedelics like that are just legalized across the board? Do you think that's where we're moving? I do actually think we're moving towards a place, particularly for MDMA and particularly for psilocybin. I think we are moving towards a place where they are going to be uh, legalized within a medical sphere very soon. And of course, we're seeing states like Oregon and Colorado kind of try to pioneer paths forward for legal psychedelic assisted therapy, psilocybin assisted therapy in their states. I'm hopeful that MDMA will become legalized. You know, I'm a MAPS trained provider. So meaning I, I went through their MDMA training. Um, so could prescribe or facilitate that kind of treatment. Um, once I've been able to get a you know, experience myself. Actually, that's like part of what you need in order to be able to use that. Um, but you have to, ex it's a complicated thing. We're training lots of providers to be MDMA assisted therapists. But part of the process of training is you need to go through MDMA assisted therapy. And because it's a schedule one substance and is illegal, and the only way to access it is through these very small clinical trials. Uh, we've trained a ton of people in MDMA assisted therapy who haven't been able to complete the experiential part of the training. So that will be an interesting process if or when that happens. But MAPS has advocated so strongly, I mean, right down to suing the FDA for discrimination when they were trying to stop some of their clinical trials and winning, um, that I'm hopeful, and especially because they've built such a large body of evidence about MDMA's efficacy for PTSD in particular, as well as for generalized anxiety, with, I mean, absolutely wild results. I mean, 94% efficacious against PTSD at the six-month mark. I mean, that's... Crazy. It's crazy. It's I mean, just nothing else crazy. compares, especially for PTSD. What else is there that comes even close to that? Right. To help the, especially soldiers that are struggling. Like what? Right. What else right. Do and we they have? really focused on the veteran population. And I, I don't know if you've watched any of the. Nick is is one of the first people who went through these therapies, and he is very out and open and a speaker about MDMA assisted therapy. And um, so I, I reference him for anybody who wants to just sort of look at like what is it like to see some of the veterans who've been in these studies, and. Uh, it, it is, it's amazing to see people, again, regain a sense of safety and confidence and, you know, their own kind of curiosity about life back. Get their life back. Get their life back. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just an interesting time. I believe Colorado just decriminalized psilocybin yes. throughout the state. Okay. Yes. Right? And I, I'm, I'm speaking a little bit hesitantly because I'm not 100% sure. I actually thought that they had just legalized psychedelic-assisted therapy. Oh. Um, but... I want to say, that. Andy, can you see if you can find that? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, I know we did it in Arcata. Right. Psilocybin is decriminalized. And I think that's, it's not as far as you would like it to go, but you have to take a breath and say, okay, at least we're tracking in the right direction. I think we're these making are these huge movements. gains. I mean, really, these are, uh, if you look at the context of time, right? So all of these studies sort of were happening in the 50s and 60s. They all get suppressed throughout the 70s as there were massive changes in the cultural consciousness happening. And we're in the 2020s. And they're already like making their resurgence and we're finding ways to make these kinds of treatments and these kinds of models, which again, may not be the thing for everyone, but certainly have enough um, safety and evidence and a history that making them available to people as an option for them to explore as part of their healing feels like it's really important. Do you have any experience or knowledge of Ibogaine? I do have a little bit of knowledge of Ibogaine. I don't have personal experience with it. Um, my understanding is that there might actually even be a local resource for Ibogaine, which I, I don't know much about. I've just had patients reference that they've reached out to someone locally. Um, one of the things about Ibogaine in particular is that it can prolong one of the um, one of the electrical parts of your heart, your QT interval. And so it is actually really important to get cardiac monitoring and cardiac clearance before Ibogaine treatment. Um, th th that would be my one caution. But the some experiences with ibogaine, particularly for alcohol use and opioid use, absolutely profound. You know, people who have completely, after going through five days of treatment, um, no longer, it, it's just gone. It's just gone. The craving is gone. You know, we don't really know what's happening, but certainly the part of the brain that is um, rendered um, affected by addiction and substance use is the nucleus accumbens, where your dopamine comes from. 
And I have no idea what Ibogaine is doing to kind of render that part of your brain circuitry different in that period of time. But there are a lot of really profound experiences people have had from Ibogaine. That's the other one that I've heard in reference to having those breakthroughs, especially with alcohol. Is yes. You can yeah. go, you can take this along the lines of with ketamine. Mm -hmm. You can take this and it's almost like a miracle yeah. drug that you just, you're no longer, you don't, you don't want it anymore. Right. You can right. just break. Although I've heard that Ibogaine is painful right it's it's yeah it's not a fun ride going yeah, through that that no that's been my understanding as well i mean i'm sort of thinking about a, a a psychedelic medicine integration course i took where we talked about ibogaine and one of the speakers was talking about their own experience with ibogaine specifically for their opioid use disorder and um yeah it was a very not the kind of experience that you get addicted to by any means i mean she reported it as being like physically painful like very nauseous um, but, but my one word of caution would be that there are people who have um, gone to treatment centers throughout, like maybe they've gone to Mexico or different places in Latin America and didn't get the the cardiac clearance. And there are reports of people, um, you know, ending up with cardiac arrest and other kinds of arrhythmias that could have been prevented with a little bit more medical medical treatment or clearance. And with ketamine, it's just the blood pressure. That's the only other primarily hypertension more than anything else. There's some medications that we recommend that people hold the the day of and the day before treatment, um, particularly medicines that affect glutamate, lamotrigine or lamictal being the main one. Um, we do also recommend there's certain substances that can mitigate ketamine's effects. So cannabis, um, benzodiazepines, um, stimulants like Adderall or um, modafinil, those are all things that can make ketamine work a little bit less effectively. So we recommend people hold those again kind of the day before and the day of. Okay. Well, Carrie, this was fantastic. We got to get you out of here so you don't miss your thing. Yeah. Um, this was great. This was really awesome. Great. I really enjoyed talking with you. Yeah. Do you want to plug again the Center for New Growth, where people can find you, where they yeah, can find your treatments? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so we are the Center for New Growth, and we're located in Eureka. Our website is HumboldtCenterForNewGrowth.com. And if you're interested in a consultation or just reaching out to us, there's an email that you can access through that website. Our phone number is 707-267-7931. Um, and we would love to talk to anybody who's curious about ketamine assisted psychotherapy, psychedelic assisted therapy, or just a more integrative approach to mental health and trauma healing. Okay. Well, Carrie, I think, I think what you guys are doing is, is fantastic. I'm excited oh. to see where you go with that. Oh, thank you, I Nick. It's it. really been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so we'll much for your we'll curiosity. We'll have to get you back on and dive a little deeper next time. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks.